One of the James Webb Space Telescope's main goals has always been to find evidence for the first stars to have formed in the universe. Now the first stars. First population of stars. First stars. Are the first stars. First generation of stars. First stars in the universe. And this month there's been a paper published by Maiolino and collaborators claiming to have found just that in a galaxy known as GNZ11. Before the launch of JWST, GNZ11 was the most distant galaxy known in the universe, with the light taking 13.3 billion years to travel from it to us, meaning that we're seeing this galaxy as it was when the universe was just 430 million years old. Now, since JWST started observing, we found many more galaxies that have absolutely smashed that distance record. But a lot of science was already planned with GNZ11 since it was the most distant galaxy known at the time, which means we've now got a lot of data on this galaxy and there's a lot of results coming out, a lot of which I've talked about on this channel before. Just earlier this year, for example, I covered how there's a bit of a debate going on about whether GNZ11 has a growing supermassive black hole or not. You know, because the data we're getting from JWST is like nothing we've seen before. That was the point, right? But it means that we're still learning how to analyze and interpret it, which means there's a lot of room for interpretation. Which is why when I saw this research first appear online last June in 2023, I waited to cover it on my channel until it had gone through the peer review process and officially published in a scientific journal because claims of evidence of the very first stars forming in the universe, aka these population three stars, are not to be made lightly. So in this video, we're gonna chat first, what are these population three stars? Two, why are they so important in the history of the universe? Three, the evidence that Maialino and collaborators claim to have for these population three stars in the galaxy GNZ11. And four, what's next to confirm this result? So let's start with these first stars, dubbed population three stars. So we think that in the early universe, only the simplest atoms and elements existed. So we're talking like 75% of all atoms were thought to be hydrogen and 25% were helium. There were then trace amounts of lithium, but we're talking like a tiny fraction of a percent. Everything else that we can see around us, everything made from carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, all the metals like iron, you know, everything below helium on the periodic table that makes up this entire planet and all the life on it, all of those heavier elements were made in stars in some way or another. So stars fuel themselves by taking those lighter atoms and fusing them together to make heavier elements, which is what fuels them. You know, in that process, you give out light and heat, which is what makes them shine. And when the next generation of stars forms from that same gas, it's sort of like polluted gas with these heavier elements, what we call metals. To an astronomer, anything heavier than helium is a metal. And the fun thing is those metals leave an imprint on the spectrum of light that we get from a star. So when we split the light into all its wavelengths or colors and we see a star's rainbow, we find that there are colors missing because the atoms of those metals are stealing away that color of light. Each element does that a unique wavelength and color, so we can tell what a star is made from by looking at the pattern. The more gaps there are, the more metals there are in that star's atmosphere. And so if there are more metals there, it must have formed later in the universe's history when enough generation of stars had already lived and died and polluted that gas with these heavier elements. Now, astronomers in the early 20th century, such as Jan Oort and Walter Bade, noticed all of these missing colors and pointed out how you could split stars into two types, population one, and population two. Population one stars had the most metals and they were fairly young stars found nearby in the Milky Way. The sun, for example, is a population one star. Population two stars had less of these missing gaps. They were metal poor. So when they form, they form from a much sort of like purer hydrogen and helium gas. And we can see, yes, they are much older stars. They must have formed earlier in the universe's history. We tend to find these stars towards the center of the Milky Way. Now, a lot of people like to complain that the names don't make sense, which I agree, they don't really. Like if you're thinking about it in terms of like chronologically when the stars formed, 
population two stars formed earlier in the universe's history, so technically they should be population one stars instead. But you've got to remember, these were named before we really understood what was going on here. It was just based on how many gaps they had in their spectrum. So it's a hangover of just astronomy history that's just stuck in the lexicon. But what it means is that when people started considering the first generation of stars to have formed in the universe from even pure hydrogen and helium gas, they just sort of carried on the naming convention and dubbed them Population 3 stars. I agree, it is confusing and we should all just collectively decide on a new name for them, but you know, it's just something we've inherited from history and it's a name that we're stuck with. I'm sure you've got examples like that from your own life as well, whether that's like work life or a hobby. But why are these population three stars so important? Well, since they were the first stars, they also produced the first metals in the universe. Things like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Ingredients that we know are key for forming planets and for life to exist. They really were the start of the chain reaction that has led to all of us being here today. But that aside, they're also responsible for reionization, reionizing the universe. In the early days of the universe, it was so hot that particles like protons and electrons weren't bound together in neutral atoms. They were just free to roam as charged particles. They were ionized in a plasma, and so they were opaque. But as time went on, the universe cooled enough so that those particles could get bound together into atoms. The universe became transparent for the first time, and so light could free stream wherever it wanted to. And the first stars and galaxies started forming from the hydrogen gas that had now formed. But then energy from those first stars that had formed would hit into all of the surrounding gas, splitting the atoms apart, and ionizing them again. Re-ionization. So population three stars play a really important role in our theories for how we think the universe has evolved, despite the fact that they were probably really short-lived. So without any of like the heavier elements, like weighing them down, we think that population three stars could have got a lot bigger than stars today. And the larger and heavier the star you have, the faster it has to fuse its hydrogen as fuel to counteract the gravity pulling it in, which means they would have been incredibly bright, but wouldn't have lived for very long. On, like maximum 100,000 years, and yet in that short time had such a massive impact on the universe. At least that's the idea anyway in our theories, but population three stars are still completely hypothetical. Because if we're gonna find evidence for them, we have to look at the most distant objects that we're seeing as they were billions of years ago in the hope of catching them in that very short time frame that they existed in. That is where JWST comes in though. It's been designed to do just that with a big mirror to collect enough light from very faint, distant objects to be able to find evidence for them, but also detects infrared wavelengths of light because the light has been traveling for so long that it has been stretched from visible wavelengths into the infrared by the expansion of the universe. So what evidence do Mylino and collaborators have for these elusive population three stars? Well, they found a clump of helium gas that's glowing at a very specific wavelength of light. This kind of glow from helium is only ever seen when helium is incredibly hot and it's being ionized by something very energetic. It's close to the galaxy GNZ11, but not actually in the galaxy itself. The gas is sort of surrounding the galaxy in what we call a halo. And these halo clumps of gas aren't that rare. We see them in lots of other places, but usually when you see this sort of helium clump, it comes along with a bright glow at different wavelengths of light from metal elements like carbon, for example. But you can see here in the figures of this data, the red star is the location of GNZ11 here, and you can see lots of carbon there, but not in the same region that the helium is glowing in this clump over here. There's maybe some hydrogen, which is what's shown in the middle panel there. The Lyman alpha emission is a well-known hydrogen emission. So this clump appears to be a mix of hydrogen and helium gas with not a lot of metals that has been strongly ionized by something, but 
what's the something? Well, you've really only got two options when it comes to having enough energy to make helium glow at that wavelength. And it's either population three stars or a growing supermassive black hole. You know, so it could be that the energy emitted from the region surrounding a growing supermassive black hole could do this. And as we heard before, there is currently an argument over whether GNZ11 even has a growing supermassive black hole. But if you model for how much energy you can actually get from the region surrounding a growing supermassive black hole with distance away from it at the center of GNZ11, then the amount of light that you could get from a random clump of helium gas would drop off. That's what's shown in the purple there. Whereas the yellow marker point is the brightness of this helium clump we've observed at that distance from GNZ11. So it doesn't look like it's a supermassive black hole that's ionizing this clump of helium gas. The only other option you're left with is that it's population three stars that are forming in this halo of gas around GNZ11 that are ionizing this clump of hydrogen and helium gas so that we can see it. It's the first evidence that we have had for population three stars. There wouldn't be that many though, hence why we can't really see them in the infrared light images from JWST, but Mylino and collaborators estimate the total mass of population three stars that have formed in the halo is about 600,000 times the mass of the sun. So if population three stars are around about 500 to 600 times the mass of the sun, it would mean that there are around about a thousand population three stars forming in that halo around GNZ11 that are responsible for ionizing that helium. So it's a really interesting result, but if you take a minute to think about it, there could also be another explanation for what they're seeing, and that is that there's something in the foreground that's photobombing the image that's producing that glow of light. It could be a completely different element entirely, emitting light at a completely different wavelength, but because of the expansion rate of the universe, it stretched it to a different wavelength that makes it masquerade as emission from helium at a much greater distance away from us. So I don't think what they've got is enough to prove the existence of population three stars necessarily just yet, but it is very compelling evidence. So it's clear that more observations are gonna have to be taken of GNZ11 to confirm this result. Perhaps my and collaborators might apply for more time on JWST to get resolved spectra of this region, but across a larger wavelength range with JWST. And that would allow them to look for emission from other metals in this area, you know, that are emitting it, you know, like longer wavelengths of light, for example, to try and confirm if it is like this pristine hydrogen and helium mix of gas or not. But of course, also finding more examples of this would probably help their cause even more. Showing that maybe it's a common thing, that this isn't a freak detection, that population three stars are ubiquitous. And to do that requires resolved spectral follow-up around a lot of the distant JWST galaxies that have been found which is actually good news because that data is already being taken by JWST because it's useful for a whole host of other scientific reasons. But interestingly enough, there was already a claim for evidence of population three stars that came out before this research. And it used the exact same method, just in a galaxy slightly closer to us. And it was published by Wang and collaborators, first appearing online back in 2022. But as far as I can tell, hasn't been officially published by a journal yet, which again is why I hadn't yet covered it on my channel. But this is a huge research area with so many articles published on this already, you know, working through the maths and the theory of what we should expect to see with JWST, you know, assuming some properties of the early universe and population three stars. So no doubt this will not be the last that we hear of either GNZ11 or claims of evidence using JWST of population three stars, the first stars to have ever formed in the universe. Before we get to the bloopers, a huge thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Brilliant is where you learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in science and maths and data analysis, programming and AI. Brilliant is a learning platform that's designed to be uniquely effective. Their first principles approach to each new topic helps you build understanding from the ground up, a method that's been shown to be six times more effective than passively watching lecture videos. Now, a lot of what underpins astrophysics research these days is 
data analysis. And Brilliant has recently launched a ton of new data analysis lessons, all of which use real world data to train you to see trends and make better informed decisions. If you are a complete beginner or you're continuing to learn more about data analysis, it doesn't matter. They have a whole suite of new content from Bayes' theorem to multiple linear regression. So to try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on that link in the video description below. And with it, you'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And now roll those bloopers. Testing, testing, one, two, three. How does this sound? Testing the new microphone. I'm sure there'll be many comments from people who are like, oh, the audio sounds better. Thank you. Such as Jan Ort and Volta Bade. Bade? Bard? Volta Bade. I'm gonna have to check that. Volta Bade. Bade. I was right. Nice. Volta Bade. Oh, I should probably check Jan Ort while I'm here as well. Jan Van Ort. <laughs> oh, that definitely wasn't right. <laughs> I've been hit by a wave of sneezes because that was so wrong how to pronounce.com first came out. But this is a, sorry, I heard like the weirdest buzz and it was like, I was like convinced like a bee had landed on me. That was really weird. Like, did you, like I felt like I flinched, but like this like weird, like went up my spine at the same time. I'm imagining things. Do you like my blue wall? I hope you've enjoyed my little updates on my office series. Very proud of my blue wall. So no doubt this will not be the last. Don't speak, I know just what you're saying. Don't be stupid, explain it. No doubt, I'm it.